You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Way Back Wednesday. I'm Randy Adcox. Glad you could join us tonight. Uh, got a lot of ground to cover tonight, and uh, we're going to try to solve a bit of a mystery. Um, I got a call. Actually, I got a text first, and then we had a couple of phone call exchanges uh, from Miss Joyce Dasher. Some of you may know Joyce. She's actually the curator of the Rocky Mount Railroad Museum down at the train station. And she sent me a message initially and said that she had been referred to me by someone who uh, thought I might could help her uh, gather some information. And so I actually arranged to go down to the train station um, and, and go into the museum down there. And there's a mural on the wall that was painted by a bunch of kids from, I think, Nash Central High School. And it, uh, it depicts a, uh, a train locomotive on a track uh, beside a building. Uh, the picture was actually painted, uh, the painting I should say was, was done from a picture. Um, Joyce couldn't find the picture when I was there to show me the original, but uh, this bunch of high school, I guess art class students uh, painted this really neat looking mural. In fact, if you would, Lee, go ahead and put up that first picture. That is the mural itself, and we'll talk a little bit about this. But um, I went through my notes, and see, can you zoom out a little bit, Lee, so we can get a little better picture of the, of the house itself, because that's the, that's the big question mark right now we're trying to figure out. Um, Ms. Stasher referred to this building a couple of times during our conversation, and, and I'm, not, I'm not sure if I misunderstood her or if she was just referencing a building that I have never heard of. But supposedly this picture, this was a, a painting was done from a picture, and the picture was taken somewhere down at Emerson Shops down South Rocky Mount. There you go. And the little house to your right, she referred to it a couple of times, and it sounded like she was saying either a mock-up building or a mark-up building. But I've searched high and low through all the pictures I've got. Um, I could not find a building that looked like this particular building. Um, did several searches, couldn't find anything in the searches for either a markup building or a mock-up building. Um, so I'm hoping some of you old railroad folks can kind of help us shed some light on this. As I said, the painting was done uh, by some high school art class students. So we've got a call. Let's see if we're going to solve this mystery right now. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Yeah, Rand. How you doing this evening? I'm doing well, sir. I hope you are. Yes, sir. This is Randy. Want to talk to you, McDonald's? Uh, yeah. I ain't looking at it right now, Randy. That's what they call the old roundhouse. That is the roundhouse. Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. Uh, that's the roundhouse. That's what you might say the hostler's yard. Okay. It's where the engines got fueled and stuff, and the hostlers, you know, took care of putting the engines together, sand and the fueling. But that's considered the roundhouse right there. Okay. Well, it's, it's possible I misunderstood what she was saying, but she made a couple references to it, and it sounded like each time she was saying either markup or mock-up. I've heard of the roundhouse, obviously, but uh, I, I couldn't I couldn't make any any sense out of what I thought she was saying. So maybe she was saying roundhouse, and I just misunderstood her. But if you uh, go in the front door right there, that was where you went into the roundhouse foreman's office, and then to the side there, that's where the the hostess kind of went in and had a bench to sit on and uh, got instructions from the roundhouse foreman, but. That engine's kind of coming. Well, if you're looking at that at that train there on the left hand side, you know where that big um, the shops are. You know where the, uh, as you showed it one time before, the, the building's about to come apart. Where the engines used to go in and got service, changing brake shoes, oil, yes, sir. right, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. on the left, as you're looking at the picture on the left side, there is where that great big uh, uh, machinist the uh, buildings at. Okay. Building so the roundhouse itself is long gone, I take it. It's gone. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's gone now. Okay. 
But it's right up there close to, you know, Bassett Street, whatever. That's that's where that's the old roundhouse right there. Okay. It's considered the roundhouse. Gotcha. Okay. And, and tell, refresh my memory, why was it referred to as the roundhouse? Well, I think, well, I heard I said one, I think they had something like what you might say, like a turntable. Okay. I think they got in, it's like if it was headed north, you put it on there and you turn it to head it south. Gotcha. That, that it's kind of like, it's kind of like a turntable that it turned, I've heard that, I didn't ever really see it because I heard out 71, but I heard they had it like that where you put an engine up on there and it kind of turned it, but, mm-hmm. you know, after that, when I was there, they had what they call a Y. You're leaving the CO down there, you're going north and you turn to the right like you're going towards Tarver. Right. And you stop right there at uh, Bassett Street, and you, you throw a switch, and you go around the wild like you went back towards uh, the city of Rocky Mount. You stop, throw another switch, and you come back, see the engine was turned. That's what you call the Y. Uh-huh. I see. What you call running around the Y. It's, I mean, if you look at it from aerial view, it looks just like a Y. You mm-hmm. know, because you turn the engine from south to north or whatever. Gotcha. Okay. That's All right. Okay, well, I'll let you get back. All Maybe right. I might call you. Okay, appreciate that. Thanks again. <laughs> Okay, and, and you know, as I said, it's entirely possible that I misunderstood what uh, Miss Dancer was saying. Um, I thought perhaps, uh, you know, we would be able to identify this, so I appreciate that Randy for calling in and, and clearing that up for us. And you know, I had a talk earlier today, I was, uh, well, earlier this week actually, uh, I'd called around a few folks and, and tried to get some information and tried to nail down this markup or mock-up, and of course no one knew anything about it. Um, but uh, when I talked to Sam Parham, and Sam, I think uh, uh, if you're watching, I appreciate your input because Sam, uh, like myself, didn't know anything about a markup or a mock-up build, and he, of course, at that time had not seen this picture. And um, But he put a bug in my ear that I, I did some research on and came up with a fairly interesting story, I thought. And uh, we're going to show you some pictures um, and talk a little bit about the Great Railroad Strike of 1922. And basically what happened, um, you know, in World War I, the railroad was the main mode of transportation around the country, certainly for the civilian population, but even troop movements and equipment um, was moved around the country and around the world, I should say, uh, by train. And so in the United States, the, uh, the federal government um, actually took over the train system uh, in the United States. and. During the evolution of the in, in the carrying out, you should say of I should say of the of World War One, uh, the federal government was basically in charge um, of the train station, uh, the train operation. Uh, it was nationalized, is the proper word I should say, uh, by the government. And then, of course, at the end of World War One, um, ownership and operational um, procedures of the of the trains uh, reverted back to private uh, enterprise and and private owners. And so, from what I gather, that's when the the difficulties began. After World War II was over with, I'm sorry, World War One was over with, and um, and then ownership and operational um, uh, procedures for the railroad was turned back over to private entities and, and individuals. And so uh, there was, of course, labor unions involved too. And I've got some literature here I'm going to read. And Lee, if you would, let's go ahead and put up this first picture. Um, that's, um, this is actually a, a headline I found in the Rocky Mount. I did some searching to see what I could find in the Rocky Mount Telegram because certainly a, a railroad strike affected everything in the United States. Um, and, and not everybody participated. I, we'll get to that in a minute. But there was certainly a lot of, um, a lot of aspects to this strike. And this is kind of hard to read. This is a hundred-year-old newspaper uh, article, and it's, it's, it's not very clear even when I view it online. But this was from April um, of 1922, uh, and this is when they actually voted, the railroad were well, in the process of voting to go on strike. And um, he's doing the right-hand side, says, shop crafts employees to cast strike ballots. On, um, and so this was kind of the early... Um, wheels turning, if you will. Uh, there was some dissatisfaction with management. There was some, certainly different areas of the country operated differently. Uh, different uh, railroads had different operating procedures. 
and uh, some of the workers um, just felt they were getting a short end of the stick. So I'm going to read a little bit about uh, how this led up. It says, the Great Railroad Strike of 1922, commonly known as the Railway Shopman's Strike, was a nationwide strike of railroad workers in the United States. Launched on July the 1st of 1922 by seven of the 16 railroad labor organizations in existence at that time, the strike continued into the month of August before collapsing. At least 10 people, most of them strikers or family members, were killed in connection with the strike. The collective action of some 400,000 workers in the summer of 1922 was the largest railroad work stoppage since the American Railway Union's Pullman strike of 1894 and the biggest American strike of any kind since the Great Steel strike of 1919. So, you know, this, like I said, this thing had been building for some time. Um, it all kind of came to a head in July of 1922. And Lee, if you would, go ahead and let's put that next picture up here. And these pictures aren't necessarily of here in Rocky Mount. Um, and by the way, before I go any further, the screen went black and it jarred my memory. I wanted to kind of put a word out the night. Um, I was informed by the station um, people here that they replaced a piece of equipment after last week's show and they weren't sure whether that was going to solve the problem that we had been having with some you know sporadic issues of going to a black screen or uh, you know losing signal or freezing or losing audio or video or both so I'd like to ask tonight if you're watching and you experience any of that any black screens or loss of signal or freezing up or uh, you know loss of video or audio either one let us know 407 11 11 is a number of course and um, we are earnestly trying to resolve this issue. Um, I'm hoping this new piece of equipment has resolved it, but if it hasn't, we certainly want to keep a, a pulse on it and we intend to get it fixed. So, okay, so back to the railroad strike. Um, this picture actually just depicts workers just walking off the job in 1922. As I said, July 1st, 1922 is when the strike began. And um, there's another little overview here uh, that I found that kind of encapsulates the uh, the, the majority of, of what happened in a pretty nice little synopsis. Um, it said, President Warren G. Harding and his incredibly corrupt administration smashed a strike. At least 10 workers were killed, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Attorney General Harry Daugherty got federal judge James Wilkerson to issue a sweeping injunction against the workers. Union leaders were forbidden from even giving newspaper interviews. Uh, Daugherty was later forced to resign because of the Teapot Dome scandal. Um, Safety meant nothing to railroad bosses like Pennsylvania Railroad President Samuel Ray. With skilled machinists striking, 71% of locomotives failed monthly inspections from August through September 1922. So as you can see, you know, with, with multiple thousands of, of people walking off the job, um, and again, not everyone chose to strike. Some of the workers um, decided to stay on. Some workers crossed picket lines. Um, they were unaffected, unaffectedly called uh, scab or scabbers uh, because they chose to you know, side with the, the owners as opposed to the striking workers. Um, and there's a, there's a few others. Let's go to the next picture, Lee. I just want to kind of put a little background here. Um, this next picture is actually the three gentlemen. This is uh, Mr. G.W. Hanger, Mr. R.M. Barton, and Chairman Ben W. Hooper of the Railroad Labor Board which approved the wage cut for train maintenance workers that prompted a 1922 railroad shopman strike. And again, as things usually are, this thing was as much as anything else about money and finance and um, they you know, cut um, people's salary, uh, certain labor, certain jobs. Um, and as, as the article went on to say, as the war years had been a period, a, a period of dramatic inflation across the American economy. Price levels began to turn the other direction in the first years of the 1920s as increased wartime demands upon production were regularized and labor supply was expanded with the reintegration of millions of former soldiers into the employment market. In response to the changing economic conditions, railway companies obtained approval from the Railroad Labor Board in 1921 for deep reductions in wage rates for workers across the industry. Additionally, the railroad industry was affected by the open shop movement which was fostered by large employers throughout the American economy with an increasing percentage of shop work contracted out by the railroad companies to non-union subcontractors. 
During the war, the various railway, railway shop crafts, machinists, boilermakers, blacksmiths, electricians, sheet metal workers, and laborers had fully obtained the right to unionize, and they sought to maintain this economic clout. Deep tension developed between employers and railway workers across the country, and attempts by the National Civic Federation in December 1921 to arrive at an amicably remedy were unsuccessful. So, as I said, in, 19, uh, in July 1921, uh, 22, excuse me, they went on strike and the government and, and, the, and the big bosses of the railroad really kind of put a heavy thumb, if you will, on the workers that chose to strike. Um, there was a, it, this article goes on to state there was bitter labor discord and sometimes local merchants and authorities gave moral and, and actual help to the strikers. In fact, Lee, this next, go ahead and put this next picture up. Um, this picture shows a storefront, and again, these pictures aren't, I'm not sure where they're from, I don't think they're from Rocky Mount exactly, but certainly this labor strike affected every railroad yard, every community that had railway uh, workers on it uh, all over the country. But um, it says, uh, goes on to say, and sometimes local merchants and authorities gave moral and actual help to the strikers, including refusal to sell groceries to strike breakers and other commercial Boy Scots and the extension of free goods and discounts to strikers. Picnics were held in support of strikers and in some places railway guards were disarmed by local sheriffs who were seeking to avert the chance of violence. Um, women came to the aid of striking men by both provisioning those who walked picket lines uh, and walking along the lines themselves. Women were also instrumental in some places in pressuring strikers to appear on the picket line and in dissuading strike breakers from continuing to cross strike lines. In eastern Pennsylvania, for example, a crowd of 50 women and children pelted strike breakers with sour milk, rotten eggs, and spoiled produce. <laughs> So tensions obviously flared all over the country. It was a, a bitter dispute. And after several months of this, um, it, you know, it just kind of all fizzled out. The, the workers themselves were really just, they were, they were brought down by the weight of the big bosses and the federal government and, and uh, the powers that be that, that ran the railroad industry at that time. Um, and as I said earlier, President Harding uh, in, in July of uh, July 11th of 1922, Harding issued a proclamation that attempted to split the difference between two sides of the conflict, and um, and that didn't go very well with either side. Um, the labor, the railroad labor board attempted to mediate and end to dispute, and uh, on July 14th, in a, in a joint conference that was, and while the railroad officials pledged to end the, the subcontract and work to non-union shops. No retreat was made on the issue of restoring seniority to striking workers. So obviously there was, as I said, there was bitter tensions um, all the way around and you know, people lost their lives. It was certainly a dark period in, in the history of the railroad uh, and of you know the workforce and labor in the United States and indeed around the world. This, this thing hit um, and had repercussions all over the world. Lee, bring it back to me if you would. I'll tell you what, um, we're at our first uh, commercial break for the evening. When we come back, folks, we're going to, oh, we got to, let's get this call first in. Hello, caller, you on the air? Hello, caller. Oh, I think we might have lost you. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, when we come back from the break, we've got some pictures that we're going to show you. And, you know, there's, um, we've talked about certainly the Charlie Killebrew photograph collection. Uh, we've talked about the Bugs Behringer photograph collection. And on a few occasions we've even talked about Mr. Albert Rabel, or Al Rabel as it was known, also had a photo collection. It was not as extensive by any means as Bugs Behringer or Charlie Killebrew's, but I stumbled across some pictures tonight from, from Al Rabel's collection and some of these are just neat pictures and some of them are ones that we may have shown before because I, I think they kind of overlap with some of Charlie Killebrew's pictures. Anyway, we're going to have a quick commercial break. When we come back, we'll jump back into some pictures and uh, we'll take your phone calls. So don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back with more Way Back Wednesday. You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work.
I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitation and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. When faced with special care needs for elderly or disabled loved ones, families want compassionate, comforting care. That's Tender Touch Home Care Services' goal, providing the level of care we would expect for our own. With over 10 years of home care excellence, Tender Touch provides an array of services that keeps your loved one at home. From personal care, light housekeeping, errands, and meal preparation, to our private duty care program, which combines all of our home care offerings in one package. Tender Touch Home Care Services, where your needs are our concern. You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Servicing the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. And we're back. If you're just tuning in, folks, you're watching Way Back Wednesday. I'm Randy Adcox. Glad you could be with us tonight. Uh, before the break, we were talking about the Great Railroad Strike of 1922. And there was actually one picture we didn't get to. I just realized during the break that we didn't show this last picture. And it's just a, a, a lone railroad guard. Um, but what happened was, oh, we got a call. Let's get this call first. Hello, caller. You on the air? Uh, good evening, Randy. Good evening, sir. Uh, I have recently been been learned that you know the Atlantic Coastline Railroad owned. The locomotives, the freight cars, the passenger trains. But there was another company that owns the railroad track. Interesting. And that was totally a surprise to me. So uh, in your investigations, kind of keep that in mind, will you? I will do that, and you know what? We've got some uh, ex-railroad employees uh, that watch the show regularly. One just called in a few minutes ago, and so when I, we'll let you go, and then we'll get some other railroad workers to call in and, and, and get some input, uh, give us some input on that. Um, that would make Great. sense to me that, uh, that the engines and, and the trains themselves would be owned by one entity and the track another, but um, uh, yep, yeah, we'll, we'll certainly open the floor up for calls on that, and we'll see if we can find out about that. Thank you now. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, so you railroad folks out there, um, let's let's help us uh, clarify this picture. Um, railroad tracks and and um, engines and locomotives and cars owned by two different entities. It, it seems like from what this gentleman was has been told, um, and that makes I've not heard that, but that makes sense to me that it would be the case with the railroad tracks themselves extending beyond certainly county and state lines. Um, it would make I know now I think. Uh, the federal government is kind of in charge of railroad tracks. In fact, I ran across a piece of railroad track years ago. It's been five or ten years ago now. It's a short piece, about three or four foot long, and um, I don't. It was on an old farm that I happened to be doing some scrounging around with, and I picked it up with not no sure what I was going to do with it. But the thing was so heavy you could barely move it, and I took it to a scrap metal recycle yard. And the guy looked at me. He said, "No, no, 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 no. I can't touch it." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "I can't. I can't buy that from you." And um, I said, this is an old piece of railroad track. He said, I don't care. He said, I know what it is. He said, but I don't care where you got it from. He said, but I can't buy it. I don't want no part of it. <laughs> um, well, he was uh, truthfully, and I don't know, but he told me it was a federal offense for him to buy a railroad property. So anyway, there may be some truth to that. Um, this last picture of, of this segment, uh, go ahead, Lee, and put up that last picture of, of the guards sitting by the telephone pole there. Um, the... Railroad companies themselves 
if they didn't have their own security guards, they would hire independent guards and, and private armed guards. And so, and of course that caused tension too because um, these workers weren't used to being guarded by someone with, the, with a gun. And um, that's what led to the 10 deaths around the country was these armed guards. Um, and there was a story that took place here in, in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, it said in, North, in Wilmington, a company guard took exception to being called a scab by a non-striking railroad engineer and shot him dead. So, I mean, you know, that's, as I said earlier, there was just a lot of tension, a lot of friction, and um, it's good that this thing didn't last any longer than it did. I mean, from, from roughly April to August, um, a few short months there, and, and looking back on it, but um, 10 people did die, and it could have been many more. So, anyway, that was the Great Railroad Strike of 1922, and, and thanks again to Sam Parham for bringing that to my attention. I'd never heard of that. I didn't know anything about it, in fact. And it was interesting reading today and, and learning about that and, and what happened. And um, as I said, it, it affected certainly every railroad operation in the country and with Rocky Mountain Emerson Shops being as large an operation as it was and always has been, um, you know, it certainly affected this area uh, very much, very intently. So, okay. Um, I also mentioned, oh, we got a call. Let's get this caller. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Um, yeah, you know, talking about railroads, um, and, you know, I just remember as a kid that there were so many different uh, railroad providers. Um, I was from Richmond, Virginia, and there was the Atlantic Coastline, mm -hmm. there was Seaboard, mm -hmm. um, there was Chesapeake and Ohio, right. there was Norfolk Southern. I mean, and there were there were different passenger services. There were different, you know, freight services. Absolutely. Um, and then, you know, I guess as time went on, um, Amtrak became the only actual passenger service because the, all of the others went out of business by virtue of the fact that people were flying and driving their own cars. And I guess CSX is probably the biggest freight handler now. I mean, there's some railroad folks out there that um, could probably, um, you know, verify that, at least, you know, in certain parts of the country. But, you know, the, the evolution of the rail industry, particularly, you know, on the East Coast and, you know, the Southern Atlantic, I just remember that at one time there were, there were just so many uh, rail services that ultimately at one point or another had to merge um, into, you know, bigger companies or singular companies in order to survive. And um, it has, you know, gotten to the point where, for the most part, if you want to go someplace on a train, um, you go by way of Amtrak. And if you ship by rail, in many ways, I think, you know, that C around here anyway, I think CSX is probably, you know, one of your few choices. I think you're exactly right about that. And, you know, and, and you mentioned the different roads around the country. Even within the state of North Carolina, we had several different railroads. And as you said, they did all kind of merge over the years. And um, and you're exactly right, too. You know, the, the demise of the train industry, certainly as a, as a means of transport for public, was in large part due to more of the public driving their own private automobiles. And certainly when the airlines began, you know, shuttling folks around the country, too, uh, it really kind of... Uh, well, it drove a nail in the coffin for the railroad industry as far as moving passengers around. Well, and I think there was um, a considerable amount of um, deregulation that occurred down through the years, too, um, in order to make it more competitive for a long time. I think that there were government subsidies for some of the rail lines and, so, and to, to make sure that um, the trains would go to um, areas of the country or the state that would otherwise be underserved or not served at all. Exactly. Thing happened um, in many ways to the airline industry. I mean, Piedmont Airlines is gone. Eastern Airlines is gone. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, many of them merged um, into um, companies that, you know, essentially gobbled them up. That's right. Um, and, you know, and I think, you know, um, that, you know, the rail industry was kind of a template for um, a lot of the things that occurred um, as a result of deregulation that, you know, to make businesses more competitive, um, they stopped 
um, giving them any kind of subsidies. And I think, you know, the airline industry, um, you know, took that right in the jaw when that happened not that terribly long ago, probably back um, in the back during the course of the 70s. But, um, yeah, it was interesting because I knew folks that worked for the railroad, and when they retired, and to this day, um, still have pretty um, substantial railroad pensions. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, look, thanks so much for sharing that. We appreciate Have you watching the evening. show. Have a good evening. All right. Okay. Yeah, certainly, you know, we've talked before on this show about the importance of the railroad to not only the growth of Rocky Mount uh, specifically, but also eastern North Carolina and, uh, as the gentleman just said, all up and down the east coast for that matter. Uh, you can't talk about the history of, of this state and this city and this country, in fact, uh, without putting a a good hard look at the railroad because it was instrumental, particularly in the days prior to um, the other means of transportation that are available now. When it was, when you only had two choices, that was ride a horse or ride a train. Um, poor folks rode a horse and everybody else rode a train if they could afford to, to get a ticket. So anyway, okay, I mentioned also before the break that um, I stumbled across some Al Rabel pictures and you know, um, I, I'm very fond of, of looking at the pictures that Charlie Kilbrow took and that uh, Bugs Berenger took. And uh, some of the pictures that we're going to show you here in a minute, we may have seen before only because they somehow, and I didn't realize until tonight, that some of these collections, um, and some of these library collections, for example, at the Wilson Library at UNC Chapel Hill and over at East Carolina, is a, there's a photograph collection there. Uh, here our own uh, Brazel Library in Rocky Mountain has a photo collection too. And sometimes these photos get intermingled together. So you may have some Bugs Berenger pictures in with some Charlie Killebrew pictures. Uh, so you may also have some Al Rabel pictures mixed in with both of them. And so this collection I found today when I was doing research for the night show was just of Al Rabel's picture. So without any further ado, Lee, let's go ahead and bring up, I think it should be picture number seven there on your list. There you go, and this is from 1948, and obviously it's a bunch of Boy Scouts, and this was from Al Rabel's collection, and in fact it's about, a, I don't know, a dozen and a half or so we're going to go through here, and um, he was obviously very much uh, in tune with the scouting, uh, both Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, I, I found several pictures over the years, and 1948 seems to be the year that uh, Al Rabel um, got his start in photography. Um, I don't know very much about the man. I read some articles and some comments on some forums. Um, I, I think he was a college professor. He went up north for a while and taught college. But um, in any case, it looks like he started take, taking pictures around 1948. And in fact, there was a couple of these that were captioned, the beginning of my photography for career. And this was one of them, uh, Boy Scouts in 1948. Uh, the next picture, Lee, go ahead to the next one if you would. This is also, uh, I'm assuming, more Boy Scouts. They weren't in uniform here in this picture, but in any case, they were obviously sitting on, on cots um, just outside of a tent. I can't tell if they're, some of them are in the tent, I think. Um, and this brings back memories for me. I was a, a Boy Scout in my younger days. I was a Cub Scout, too, for that matter. But uh, I used to love going camping and um, you just enjoy the camaraderie with the other guys, and it just, it's a lot of good fun. And um, this also was from 1948. Um, so again, these were, these were some of the very early pictures that Al uh, Rabel took. And um, in later years, he, he did quite a bit of photography. Nothing on the scale of, of Charlie Killebrew or Bugs Berenger, uh, but he certainly held his own as far as the quality of photographs that he did take. Okay, let's go to the next picture then. Some of you may know something about this. I had never heard of the Tar River Boys Club, but the Tar River Boys Club had a dance every year for a few years anyway. I'm not sure how long it lasted. I'm not sure when it started. This picture is from 1949, and you see the down the forefront of the picture at the front there uh, is the band. There's a guy with a slide trombone there. I look like a guitar player, or maybe that might be a stand-up bass player, actually. But the point is that... Um, there was this group of young men called the Tar River Boys Club, and they had a dance. I saw pictures from starting from 1949, 1950, 1951, and so, you know, we talked a few weeks ago about the June German and how important it was to the area, you know, as a means of getting people together to socialize and uh, what a big deal that was. 
as you can see these folks are very very nicely dressed with their finest attire and so this was a big deal too obviously and you know we've talked in, in past shows about the things that used to go on in this city that, that are no longer happening and that's it's really sad um, these kinds of social events that brought people out uh, give them a chance to get away from work and the stress of home life <laughs> and just go out and kind of kick their, their shoes off and have a good time for an evening um, I think it would do us all good to better do some of these events again but anyway this is from 1949 and there's uh, about three or four if you want to leave go ahead to these next ones there's three or four in this group that are all the Tar River uh, Boys Club and this picture was just captioned saxophonist and band at formal dance and then beneath this picture and you can't see it here because it, it was cut off when I cropped the picture but it actually listed this as being uh, another instance of the uh, Tar River Boys Club dance and I can't tell where this picture was taken at and I don't know if, if any of you remember uh, the Tar River Boys Club or going to any of these dances apparently back in the late 40s early 50s though they went on for a few years and um, I've not been able yet to find exactly what it, what the Tar River Boys Club was all about other than the fact they had a dance every year for a few years so okay let's go to the next picture if we could then and this next one is from 1949 and again you can see these folks are decked all out uh, they've got the room where they are I, I kind of want to suspect this could be Bimini Country Club I, I'm not sure it's been many many years since I was in that building um, but it looks to me to be a little more formal than the tobacco warehouses where the June Germans were held but then again I'm sure it's on a much smaller scale too than the June Germans if you remember we talked about the June German drawing sometimes as much as eight or ten thousand people to some of those dances so this Tall River Boys Club dance was on a much smaller scale uh, these even look to be much younger uh, group of, of people here um, they, they may have been the sons and daughters of the elite crowd that would attend the June German but these folks to me look to be and, and the name implies as much Tar River Boys Club so I'm, I'm thinking these were probably the the kids of maybe the upper echelon they could have been high school kids I'm just not sure um, but they had a dance um, okay so let's go ahead Lee this next picture is from 1950 uh, oh I forgot about I had this on there this is actually uh, there you go. I, it does say that Bimini Country Club in here. Now, this picture, Lee, which uh, number is this? Number 12? 12. Well, this is 12. Okay. Uh, in 1950 is when this article was, came out in the Rocky Mount Telegram. So, and it does clearly state in the headline Tar River Boys Club Dance at Bimini Country Club. So, I don't know if those earlier dances in 48, 49 were also held at the Country Club. Um, and I'd forgotten I, I included this clipping just kind of as a, as a reference but yeah in 1950 they did have the dance at Bimini Country Club and as I said it was a much more scaled down party if you will dance environment than the June German certainly would have been but uh, still it looked good times had by all so okay so I tell you what Lee let's go ahead bring it back to me this is I just realized we had our second commercial break before we get into this next group of pictures um, We'll take a break. Uh, folks, if you need to get yourself a little snack or a little bathroom break, go ahead and take care of the business right now. And we'll be right back with more Way Back Wednesday to show you some more pictures in just a minute. Don't go anywhere. You're now watching Way Back Wednesday. Sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitation and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. When faced with special care needs for elderly or disabled loved ones, families want compassionate, comforting care. 
That's Tender Touch Home Care Services goal, providing the level of care we would expect for our own. With over 10 years of home care excellence, Tender Touch provides an array of services that keeps your loved one at home. From personal care, light housekeeping, errands, and meal preparation to our private duty care program, which combines all of our home care offerings in one package. Tender Touch Home Care Services, where your needs are our concern. You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. And we're back. Folks, for just tuning in, you're watching Way Back Wednesday. I'm your host, Randy Adcock. So glad you could join us. Uh, a couple of things before we jump back into our pictures. I had a call during the break that uh, called in and said that um, they were experiencing some popping and, and some audio difficulties in the signal. Uh, we're not sure whether that's originating here in the station or whether it's coming through. He said he was a Sunlink subscriber, so it could be the cable company too. Um, but at the top of the show, I mentioned if you're, if you're having any at all, any audio, video, uh, freezing, black screens, any of that kind of stuff, let us know, 407-1111, numbers on your screen there. Um, we are earnestly trying to resolve these technical issues. Uh, there was a new piece of equipment put in after last week's show, in fact, and so we were hoping and optimistic that, that cleared up some if not all of the problems um, and sometimes these things just happen so oh got a call let's get this caller hello caller you on the air okay we're talking about the uh television signal yes sir okay this old man is on a, a screen antenna okay so it's not happening on the antenna. Interesting. It might it might be worth looking at the cable systems. So you're watching this over the air then with a regular yep. rooftop antenna. Yes, sir. That, uh, that's interesting. It sure is. And you're not having any hey. problems with audio or video tonight. All right. Take care now. All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. All right. Yeah, and the caller who called in during the break said himself it could be the cable company because they are having some issues around town. So um, hopefully we've got this technical issue resolved. But as I said, it's it's really important, and I stress that everyone that works with uh, this station is just as committed as I am to making sure we've got a good quality broadcast signal. Um, and so if ever we fail to deliver that, we want to hear from you. Okay. All right, let's jump back into our pictures, if you would, Lee. I think we're on number 14 now. And this was just a random picture that, um, that Al Rabel took in 1950 of three young girls in a, in a soda shop somewhere. The soda shop itself was not identified, nor were the three young ladies. And I looked at this picture, and uh, honestly, I, I can't tell where this was. I, it looks similar to places I've been in the past. Um, certain aspects about it remind me of... Um, uh, Kay Redding's place over on Tarver Street, but it's not, I don't think it's there. Uh, certain things remind me of uh, Miss Georgia's Central um, Carolina Cafe, but I, I'm pretty sure it's not there. So I'm, I'm not sure where this picture was taken, but it was 1950. And I mentioned earlier about, you know, Al uh, Rabel certainly did not have the expansive collection of photographs uh, that a, a Charlie Killebrew had or a Bugs Berenger had. But you know, I zoomed in on these pictures on my computer when I was preparing for tonight's show. And, and the quality of these photographs is every bit as good as what I have seen in Charlie Killebrew's photographs and Bugs Barrett's photographs, and in fact, many other photographs who were much more widely known in photographic circles. Um, I don't know what kind of camera he used, I don't know what kind of film he used. Uh, but you can, as Lee is zooming in now, but on these, and by the way, these pictures are all, just so you know, for those that are, that are on the internet, if you ever want to try to find these things, feel free to let me know, I'll be glad to. I've got links on my computer that I can click on and go straight to these collections, 
And um, so it's really fascinating to me to click on these things on the internet, on the computer in my office, and then zoom in and look at the detail because I'm, I'm some of these things you can actually read the titles of these books. You can see if they're if whatever they're drinking, if there's anything written on the cups, you can see that. Um, it's just, it's just a lot of quality there that that's, you miss sometimes with some of these old photographs. So, okay, Lee. Um, let's go to the next one. This next one is also from 1950. Um, and this is just um, a young lady. It says, uh, the, this picture was captioned, Young Girl at the Falls. And so uh, anyone who's ever spent any time down below the dam at uh, Rocky Mountain Mills down there, jumping on the rocks. Uh, I spent hours and hours as a kid jumping all those rocks. and falling skinning my knee a few times too for that matter but um, these pictures like this and of course girl with her bobby socks and below the knee link dress just says so much about the 1950s i mean there's almost an innocence here in this photograph that you just don't see the day I, you know it's just it's refreshing to look at these old pictures and you know um, these folks were very conservatively dressed um, and just, I don't know, just, it was a different time. The best way to say it was a different time. Okay, the next picture, Lee, if you would, um, goes back to 1950 also. And this is actually a photograph uh, somewhere in downtown Rocket Mount, I believe, of a Christmas decorated window in a department store. So if you would, Lee, let's bring, there you go. Um, this caught my attention because there's a collection of women's sweaters for a dollar ninety nine cent. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to go shopping and be able to pick out your girlfriend, wife, or daughter a sweater for a dollar ninety nine cent? Uh, in 1950, you had a whole slew to choose from there. Um, I'm not sure which store this was. Honestly, I couldn't tell. I tried to zoom in and, and get that information, but I just couldn't find anywhere within either one of these two um, sales banners here that, that identified the store. But uh, I would certainly guess downtown Rocky Mount, um, possibly Pennies or Belts, one of the two, I would guess. Uh, could have been Efforts or Charles Department Store, too, for that matter. Um, but the great big plate glass windows. Um, I can just imagine young kids at Christmas time with a nose pressed up against the glass. Not this particular store instance here, but certainly um, when the stores were filled with Christmas items and toys for kids and so forth. I, this was just a, a neat time and to be able to look at those great big plate glass windows and see all kind of neat stuff in there uh, was certainly a, a great time to be in downtown Rocky Mount, I'm sure. Okay, Lee, let's go to the next picture if you would. And this next picture, this was actually uh, identified, uh, the subcaption was a glass installation at Bernard Taylor Motor Company. Now I gotta tell you, if I've heard about this before, it had slipped my mind. I, I, I was kind of startled for a minute. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Bernard Taylor Motor Company, where have I heard that or have I heard that? And so I got to do some looking. This is obviously, it looks like either a sales counter or maybe a cashier where you would pay your bill when you got through having your car worked on or whatever. Um, but this was from 1950 also. Uh, these last three or four years have all been from 1950. So what I did, I went and pulled a 1950 city directory. And I looked up where the Al, I'm sorry, where the Bernard Taylor Motor Company was located in 1950. And Lee, if you would, let's pull up this next little image here, um, and you can zoom out on it because it automatically zoomed in. But this was actually the listing from the 1950 city directory for the Bernard Taylor Motor Company, and. Zoom out now, Lee. Now you got there. You go. You zoom out some more so you can see the whole thing on the screen. There you go. There you go. A little more. A little more. A little more. There you go. That's good. Uh, as you can see, the address was 811 to 813 South Church Street. Had a phone number of 3000. <laughs> and so I thought, okay. Um, so 811 to 813 South Church Street. If you remember from last week's show, we showed a picture of Davidson Company Auto Parts. That was at 809 South Church Street. And when I went looking for that building, it had been torn down. So I went back on Google Street Search and pulled, punched in um, 811 to 813 South Church Street. And Lee, if you would, let's put that next picture up because this picture uh, and Google Maps actually lets you 
not always and not with every instance, but sometimes it'll show you a present day picture and then there'll be a little slider control that you can slide and go back and look at the exact same spot from years past. And lo and behold, when I went to 811 to 812 and it showed uh, the 2019 image, it was a vacant lot here. And if you remember from last week's show, when we showed Davis Company Auto Parts, that little yellow building was there. I think Davis Company was somewhere in close proximity to that. But when I went back and slid the slider back to 2007, boom, this building appeared. So I think it's been remodeled because keep in mind 1950 was when the picture was taken um, of the um, Bernard Taylor Motor Company. But I think this may have been the same building in 19, I'm sorry, in 2007. The building is now gone. It's been demolished and is no longer even there. But this gives the indication, to me anyway, it kind of puts me in a mindset that this could have been a car dealership. And so if anyone remembers uh, going to Bernard Taylor Motor Company back in the 50s, it was a long time ago, I know, but uh, if you remember anything about the place, give us a call, 407-1111. But if you go look at Google Maps now and punch in 811 or 811 to 812, or whatever it was, South Church Street, it's a vacant lot there. This building that you're looking at here now is gone. It's no longer there. But like I said, Google Maps did let you go back with a slider control back to 2007. And lo and behold, when I did that, this building popped into view. So those windows look newer to me than what would have been there in, in the 1950s. But the building itself, the general architecture of the building looks like it was probably the original building when Bernard Taylor Motors was there back in the 1950s. Okay, so let's go then lead to the next picture. This next one is one that I think we have shown before. I, I recognized it. This is actually the Peacock Meat Company and it was uh, the exterior. Uh, and this was from 1951, and so um, the I think so. I can recall someone calling and saying this was the back of the building. It was only captioned as being identified as the um, the Peacock Meat Company exterior. It didn't reference it being front, back, side, or whatever. But it does look to me to be the back of the building. Uh, why he took a picture of the back of the building, I don't know. But anyway. Okay, and I, I just realized I had a uh, text, someone texted me a few minutes ago, and the three little girls at the table with a jukebox, someone said it looked like Mrs. George's, and I agree, I, it did remind me of Mrs. George's too, uh, because of the jukebox, in fact. Oh, we got a call, let's get this call. Hello, call, you on the air? All right, some, some time back you showed the picture of this property, and right there you're looking at the back side of Peacock Meat Company, and that little narrow door on the left-hand side is where hogs and cows that went through that door, they were making their last move into a room where they were killed. Okay. And uh, that building, the front, the other side of that building is faces uh, Sherrard Street over there on the same side of the street where Dr. Joel Company's office used to be. Mm -hmm. And back in there behind where the camera is located at is where the stockyards were. Peacock Meat Company got formed in about 1946 or 47, about the same time that MB Meadowbrook Meat Company had their place on Meadowbrook Road. Okay. That's the back side, and that place of business is right there about a block away from where my folks' place were. On Pitt but, Street? And uh, it, it, uh, it came into existence about the same time that Meadowbrook Meat Company came into existence. Okay. And uh, that, that, that fence you see on the left-hand side is what kept the animals as they were making their trek to go through that narrow door on the left-hand side of the picture. Mm -hmm. When they went through that door, they never came back out of it until they were packaged. <laughs> okay. Under do you understand I, I think what we, I am saying? Yes, sir, I do. I think that was a slaughter I remember room. the back side of that building <laughs> very well. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, look, I thank you for calling in. I appreciate the information. 
Goodbye. Have a good evening. Good night. Yep, they were. That was a slaughter room there. In case you hadn't gathered that, that's what that was. Okay, let's go ahead and leave. We've only got a few minutes left here. Let's see how many of these will get through within the last few minutes of the show. Um, this was a picture taken. Again, these are another Al um, Rabel picture, and it was captioned. Um, Kids eating at Elks Lodge home, 1951. So I, I, it kind of led me to believe that the Elks Lodge had a facility outside of the lodge itself, a home, if you will, a house. Um, because it doesn't look like what I'd expect a lodge, it looks like a home. But there was another picture, I believe you go to the next one too. Um, there you go. And this was also captioned, group of kids uh, at the Elks Lodge Christmas. You see the Christmas tree in the background there and all these kids. So I don't know if this was an orphanage or if it was just a, a place where kids would come, uh, their family would bring them. I, I don't see any adults other than it looks like maybe a, um, well, I don't see any adults in this, but these look all to be kids of varying ages from uh, four or five years old up to maybe 12 or 13. But in any case, these were pictures that were identified as being affiliated in some way with the Elks Lodge in 1951 at Christmas time. So, okay. Alrighty, well, there's a call. Let's get this call. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Alright, the Elks Lodge back in those years would have been up there in the 600 block of Sunset Avenue. Long in there, just west of where Dr. Justice's office was. He was a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. 600 block of Sunset Avenue it was on, in those years, it would have been a two-way street. And that's, uh, I'm thinking, it's where the Elks Lodge would have been in the early 50s. Was there a separate home? A what? A separate home, an Elks Lodge home. I, don't, I know nothing about that. Okay. I, I'm not sure by these pictures, the way they were captured, it kind of led me to believe that there may have been a home that was either owned by the Elks Lodge or... Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't gather to be part of the Elks Lodge itself, but it could have been. I just wasn't sure. All okay, right. buddy. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, I tell you what, Lee, bring it back to me. We've got, I had some more things I wanted to share with you. If we run slam out of time, I tell you what, I'll save these next, I don't know, maybe seven or eight more. We'll save them for next week's show. In the meantime, I want to thank you that called in. I want to thank you for your feedback about the show. We really are earnestly trying to get these technical issues resolved. And so I hope that we've had a good broadcast signal tonight. And um, we'll have it continues for that matter. So, folks, take care of yourselves. Have a great, have a great week. And we'll see you next week. More Way Back Wednesday. By the way, be kind to each other. And we'll see you. Good night. by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work.